and not uh, give in general terms Africa is good or bad or Europe is good or bad. Also in Europe you have different approaches. You have different uh, countries who take refugees, who treat refugees or migrants in a different way. And of course saying this, we have always to differentiate between enforced migration and other kind of migration. As you said yesterday when he spoke about his intention, and this was mentioned also just uh, by the colleague from Ethiopia. So I think it's not about accusation, you know, you are bad because you do that. It's about to, re to receive in our minds what is the attitude of the others, what is the problem of the other, why is the other reacting in a way I am not uh, uh, consenting, I'm not agreeing uh, on and then try to find a common strategy because what we want to do is not uh, uh, the blame game but what we want to do is to say to the leaders in our countries and the leaders who come together uh, at the uh, EU uh, Africa summit what is a realistic project not to solve issues from one day to another there is nothing to solve but that's what I said yesterday to manage it in a human way respecting the different kind of interests and we and this is my last remark we also noticed yesterday and other in the talks we had uh, in the days before that Uganda is a very good example and they do a very good job but nevertheless of course there are people who say well I'm living here I'm an Ugandan why are they getting a priority on some of the issues so these things are here in, in African countries and European countries and we have to deal with it because many people think they are neglected or they are not uh, getting what they think they deserve. So I think we should be in a very open mind, exchange ideas, different of course, ideas. But I think that is the purpose of, of this morning. And I'm very happy that we could, uh, Winnie, I got to know her via her book because she was very active in looking in the story of, of uh, migrants. And I think that is the important element and we s therefore we started also yesterday with this issue that they should tell us because as I said they are the real experts and they know what happened and some people have mentioned it also especially of course what happened to, to many girls and women um, but in general I think the, the tragedy connected with forced migration and with uh, being very often in a situation not to survive the long travel uh, is a big obligation for us all, for African and Europeans. Winnie, please. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be brief because my colleague has said everything. Uh, we're very distinguished and very honored to have a panel uh, comprising of uh, distinguished guests from different countries. And uh, we're here today to hear your perception on the issue of uh, migration and forced migration, both from the European and the African perspective. Um, I think we'll start from my right. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome, Naomi. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I first want to say uh, who I work for. Um, so I work for the ECDPM, which is the European Center for Development Policy and Management. So uh, it's not to be confused with a European institution, not at all, it's a think tank. So what we try to do is to bring the African and EU actors together in order to mediate and bring about more comprehensive and more efficient migration policies. Um, so I'm going to talk about the European perspective. Uh, it's not necessarily um, what I would think, but it's, it's what is being in the European um, narrative uh, right now. So, uh, first of all, um, there, when the EU talks about migration, what we think uh, about directly as Europeans are the boat people. Because this is what we are being fed on the news, this is what we are talking all the time. However, what needs to be said is that when we talk about irregular migrants, actually most of them come by plane regularly and then overstay visa. So there is already some sort of a mismatch here between um, the type of policies that are being targeted at boat people, but actually when we talk about irregular migrants, it's, it's a much broader issue. Um, second of all, um, it has become increasingly difficult for the EU to deal with migrants um, because, of our, because of the fact that our international and European frameworks 
uh, do not uh, capture the complexity of human mobility in 2017. Because we have a clear distinction between, for example, um, uh, refugees and economic migrants. Refugees have a very clear uh, status and, and protection. However, economic migrants not so much, but we know we, we have a definition. We, we know there is a distinction between the two. However, over the, over the years, the, the motives of migrants uh, have overlapped or become more and more uh, <coughs> complex and often for economic migrants it's the difference between uh, having one opportunity or no perspective at all. So it's not forced migration per se but the lines are, are getting blurred. So um, yeah it's, it's um, very difficult I think for the EU to distinguish between uh, the different type of migration. Um, so what I, yeah, because there are many, many gray zones um, be between the different type of um, mi migrants, um, or the classification of migrants. Um, so the EU policy uh, uh, on development have been heavily focusing on stopping irregular migration since 2015 or so. So how, the way they deal with that uh, is by tackling the root causes. I'm sure you've all heard about this root cause debate. Um, and to invest in development. So it is expected by investing a lot of money and tackling the root causes very quickly, in a few years, we will stop migration. However, what we know is that development is a long-term process and it's not by throwing money that we will actually change anything on the short term. And the problem with this discourse is that it's meant to stop migration and not actually to invest in development on the long term uh, for the interest of the people, for genuine development purposes. So. Um, viewing, uh, and we also know that uh, development uh, leads to, is a driver of migration. We know that some migration um, is an inevitable result of development. It's a, it's a theory we know for a long time, we can discuss it later. Uh, but so we should not uh, use development assistance um, with, with, as a tool uh, to, um, uh, to stop migration because that, that does not make sense. Um, so another point I want to make is that uh, development, the development aid shouldn't be used also to uh, tackle uh, forced displacement. Forced displacement is, is directly linked to armed conflicts, and armed conflicts require humanitarian assistance and political discussions, mediation and everything, and then development assistance. That comes as a second step when things are a bit more settled. So that is also uh, because we see that a lot of the development aid right now is uh, geared towards Syria, for example, um, uh, while it's still at war, and that doesn't, that's not the right tool to use. We have other tools that we should use for that. Um, lastly, um, viewing development assistance um, with the idea of reducing um, migration flows is also problematic in the sense that then European countries use their development assistance within the country to, to stop, to, to host refugees in their countries. So it means that money that was meant to be geared um, towards developing countries is actually staying in European countries. Um, so that is, that is allowed, that it is, it's, uh, it's under the, the OECD DAC definition and, and all that, it, it's allowed, but it is again a, a little bit of a, of a mismatch. Um, and what we see also in the policy documents in the last year is that there is a normative shift uh, in policy documents towards more conditionality. So conditionality is not per se a terrible thing. What is terrible is to use conditions uh, that are linked to containing migrants. Um, that is also, um, we have this Lisbon Treaty and we have a, 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 a Article 208 of this treaty which is supposed to describe um, how EU cooperation should, uh, sh should be um, used and for what purpose. And this very clearly states that uh, your development assistance should be used uh, to eradicate poverty on the long term. And I personally don't see how uh, containing migration and, and investing more in border management and, and building fences is actually uh, considered uh, as a tool to reduce poverty. So also what we've seen in the, in the last years is that European countries are more and more interested in, in countries that matter geographically uh, um, for the migration uh, purpose. So countries of transit, 
countries of, of origin. We've seen that also in the, in the last EU Africa Leaders Summit last week, uh, which was a, a very small uh, summit in Paris, uh, which, which has for title to uh, stop um, illegal migra irregular migration. And who was invited there? Well, transit countries, Chad, Niger, and Libya. And what was um, expressed in this summit was to externalize European borders into Africa, to have hotspots where um, uh, asylum seekers could already lodge their applications in Africa. So that is not a problem per se. Again, the idea is that um, what is wrong with this is that it's meant in a way uh, that is towards re uh, reducing uh, irregular migration, um, but in the sense that it's more it's, it's not in order to encourage people um, to lodge the application. That, that's kind of the purpose that is being said. Uh, so we will save lives and we will cut the grass under the smugglers' feet. Uh, but it is the main purpose is also to stop migration. Um, and it's not in my eyes by uh, rejecting our uh, responsibilities on other countries and throwing money into that that we actually uh, are being solidaire and trying to share um, this, this, this situation together. Um, so yeah, I will stop here, but uh, I'll be eager to, to discuss more um, later. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have Kati next uh, to give us a perception. Yes, thank you and uh, good morning to all. And actually, Noemi already touched on, uh, I think, most of the points that I think are key in the debate uh, back home in Europe. Um, the talk is we want a better management of migration, but the reality is if you look at the policies that European countries are trying to do everything to get quick fixes and a stopping of migration. And I think until we don't, politicians in Europe, don't admit that stopping migration is something impossible and probably also unwanted, you will continue to pursue the wrong policies with the wrong tools. And that is, I think, what we are seeing in the last two years. The EU 28, the 28 European countries um, uh, are actually externalizing border management. And although we say we don't push back people in need, it's what we do is we pay the, the Libyan Coast Guard to do it for us. We struck a deal with Turkey and made Turkey close its border to Syria, where we all know that there are refugees coming over the border, but we're also asking African countries, African governments to put up hard borders in Africa. So while we are saying we are not doing it, we are not the ones stopping refugees from coming to Europe, we actually externalize our border uh, and, and ask other governments uh, to do it for us. Within the EU, um, Hannes already mentioned within the, at the beginning, there's a huge difference. So. Within the European Union, you have, of course, a free movement, which means you need to agree on your migration policies. And this is the biggest issue, I think, in Europe, that we don't agree internally. We have very, very different approaches. You saw Germany, on the one hand, taking more than one million people in one year time. And you saw another member, Hungary, building up fences and taking in zero refugees. So as long as these EU 28 countries don't agree internally on how to humanely manage refugees, economic migrants coming into Europe, the only policy that they are pursuing is the external policy, which is aimed at stopping it, because we have a disagreement inside on how to deal with it. I, I, I do think also here it's important to make and you already mentioned it, Noemi, although it's not so black and white, to make a distinction between refugees and economic migrants. But refugees don't only have the humanitarian, but also the legal um, obligation to protect them. And relatively, if you look at who came to Europe over the last two years, the percentage of refugees, or people in need of international protection, was much higher than it was in the past. So the percentage of people coming for many more refugees than um, economic uh, migrants. But for both, no legal routes exist to Europe. So everyone, irrespective of, of which category you are in, first has to make it 
to Europe and we all know and we hear the horrible stories of what it takes to come over uh, the Mediterranean to reach a uh, European shore. On the other hand, also within European societies, although politicians say we have different categories of migrants, so we also have different policies, in reality, it really doesn't matter um, because no one is being sent back. We don't have effective return policy. And for that reason, if you say legally we make a distinction, and we don't have legal roots, but in the end anyone who comes can stay, we are losing the support of European societies for taking up, first of all, refugees in need of international uh, protection. Then I think an important debate, which is not a popular debate to say, but one of the uh, characteristics of the European countries is that they are welfare states. I think this is unique in the world, that it's a group of welfare states, which means if you don't want to create in society second-rated citizens, and I don't want to create second-rated citizens, I think anyone who lives, for instance, in my country, in the Netherlands, should have the same rights, the same chances, um, um, as any other, any other one, whether you were born there or not, it means there are limits to migration. You cannot keep up a welfare state and have unlimited uh, migration. Of course, the question is, where are the limits? And, and this is, of course, very difficult uh, to establish. Um, when it comes to tensions in our societies, and, and we saw them at the uh, with a, a small number perhaps arriving, but large debate. This was the main topical debate in politics in many of the European countries, and still is. We see attention, of course, the same as we see here. It's about housing. How come newcomers get immediately housed and some other people are on the waiting list for many years? What about jobs, especially at times or in countries where you have higher unemployment? Of course, when you have more competition, and normally it's it's it with those people who already have a, a hard time finding a job, who face uh, in their neighborhood new migrants uh, or refugees coming in, but also about integration. We have, of course, seen uh, some groups in the past, um, um, I think with also wrong government policies, not having had a very good integration um, um, history, and this is one of the uh, the topical debates we have. But also, let me be honest, it's also xenophobia. It's also nationalism. I mean, you see it rear its ugly head again in many European countries. And of course, migration has become a topic where the extreme right, whenever the m migration debate is high, the extreme right is getting a lot of votes. So it has become a very contested um, environment. Now, the EU wants quick fixes for complicated phenomena. So this will definitely lead to disappointments, <laughs> but I think also wrong policies. And yesterday, the minister said one of the issues is governance as a root cause also of poverty, as a root cause of failed states. And the EU at this moment is not looking at government, it's not looking really at equal partnership on how on an equal basis we can help each other out, but it's looking at quick fixes and border management. Like Noemi said, this is the new mantra in the European, uh, in the European uh, discourse. And um, well, I think, let, let, me, let me stay here because Hannes also warned us to be short and as a politician, it's always uh, very tempting to be uh, very long. So I'll, I'll stick here and uh, wait for your um, uh, input also in the debate, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Kati. Uh, we'll hear from His Excellency. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can um, tell you that really what we have heard uh, this morning, whether from the distinguished uh, people from different parts of Africa, from Ethiopia, from South Sudan, and also the, you know, the panelists, uh, it's quite true. This is the reality. But uh, I'm very pleased that uh, most of panelists really have uh, pointed out the, the problem. Then we have a problem, we need to deal with it together. 
you know, there is migration not only in Europe, but also in Africa. The magnitude in Africa, migration is much more higher and complex and, and, and need a lot of efforts. And also, there is also migration in Europe. And the Europeans try to tell us in Africa, please, can we help together? How can we sit together and to see how can we sort out the problem? Yes, we can do that. However, we need to tackle the root causes. What is the problem? What's, what makes this problem happening? Then we go one by one. You have a governance, yes. You have conflict, yes. You have, uh, you know, uh, also economic, yes. Maybe now uh, the magnitude of problems in Europe become much more bigger than to handle. Then I don't think there is, you know, a quick fix in short term. There is a, a solution in a long term. Then we need to tackle all aspects in different level, in different layer. And therefore, we need to sit down and to see what can be done. Yes, there is some countries who have been really uh, affected uh, in, a, uh, in a big manner, uh, whether in Europe or in Africa, by this uh, growing uh, phenomenon of uh, migration. But migration itself, it's not by itself as, as it is, but it's co connected to many things. Economic migration, maybe. Um, the need of you know, uh, getting a solution somewhere in some part of Africa before you get a uh, flux of uh, migration uh, knocking the door in Europe. Uh, that means how can we make people in Africa stay in Africa because they see the better life in Africa. That's involved not humanitarian assistance but also long, long term, medium term development, you know, uh, contribution. Um, and I'm very, uh, thank you so much for the one who really been very honest, you know, saying, you know, wh what's happening in Europe? What can we do? And what is really what we like to do, not what we can do. We like to, you know, ask some countries to be, you know, uh, police guard for uh, the borders, not to make anybody living, but uh, how they can survive. Therefore, we need to focus on that. How can we provide them with, uh, you know, uh, dignity, with uh, self-esteem, with the job, Therefore, they can stay where they are, because that's their paradise, not, not what the paradise being presented to them by the mass media. In this case, I think also there is an important role for the mass media to play, to tell everyone what is happening. Yes, no, we don't want to go to Europe to take so, you know, a benefit of social service, a social uh, assistance, because we know that also uh, it's meant for uh, Europeans. But however, there is also you know, this uh, human being in general term, in global, in global uh, level, not only specific, uh, as, as you can, uh, you pointed out very clearly that, you know, there is uh, differences even within Europe. You have Germany, which uh, wel welcome one million, uh, you know, uh, migrants, and you have Hungary, which take uh, zero. That is reflect also differences between European countries in approaching the subject. Um, I think, I think uh, with a bit of, you know, understanding for also, to help uh, to find the solution, durable solution, which is really the, the main issue, durable solution, whatever it might take. So maybe uh, we can, um, you know, combine it with the quick fix or combine it with the long-term, you know, solution. That is exactly what we need. I, I, don't, I don't believe that anyone would like to leave their home and uh, to go to misery, to go to, you know, difficult life, then you will be, you know, confronting with another society where it may be have another perspective and, you know, conception, you know, saying that, you know, that you, are take, you are coming here to take our job, you get our life, it's difficult, and then why, why you are here? And I think, uh, I think uh, with uh, uh, understanding, uh, we help each other, not, uh, not dictate position or extend or export the problem somewhere else or try to find solution from outside. We can together work together and to find solution to uh, maybe it's only problem now, but uh, with uh, with really good understanding between the two sides, Africa and Europe, we could find a good solution. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I must say, personally, I'm very excited for the fact that we are getting African perspectives. But African perspectives, based on the fact that we have representation from West Africa. Uh, dear participants, uh, my name is here, but I want to give you a bit of my background. I'm a lawyer by profession. 
I belong to several forums and uh, organizations that deal with uh, migration. I got into this because, as I said, uh, I'm a lawyer by profession, but I started as a boardroom lawyer, flary, dealing with a lot of money, and then my life changed when I was appointed a human rights commissioner. And then I discovered the two Sudans. And then after discovering the two Sudans, the line, I mean, you can read a lot in my um, other, I mean, in the internet, my name is all over, about migration, human rights, uh, gender, uh, uh, peacemaking, and conflict resolution. Those are things that I do every day for many people and for a living. And then most recently, I joined politics. I've always been a politician, but never practicing. So I, get, I got into the Ugandan parliament uh, this uh, last year, or the other year. Um, and again, I sit in the legal and parliamentary committee, as well as uh, the Human Rights Committee. So I'm still reliving uh, my life. And I like this position because it now helps me really do what I'm supposed to do on policies and on, on the law. Now, we are talking about, I mean, the main thing is really about African youth and migration, uh, the theme. And then here we are talking about migration, post-migration. And I want to start by really saying migration is a given. We all migrate. Whether locally in our villages, in our districts, in our countries, and then globally to other peoples, whatever. So it is something that we cannot put a stop to. I thank my sister here for coming up with uh, whatever. And I often, every day, I ask God, when I look at the youth of Africa, what they are going through, I ask God to give me a little longer life so that we sort this thing before we leave Africa for these youth who are not responsible for what we started, the way we started. Yesterday I talked a bit about our own policies in Africa. We need to check our policies. We need to check and improve our laws in Africa. Before we even start negotiating with Europe, before we start whatever, Africa must start speaking with one voice. I have liked the, the, the moderator for guiding us that issues of East Africa are totally different from issues of West Africa. And so are they different from issues of South Africa. We learned yesterday we have xenophobia in uh, South Africa. It's not here in this area. We refused it. But then what happens in West Africa? And now I come to our uh, what? So we have to be tight and really proper in our frameworks. We already have there for us the international frameworks. We, it's all there, and we have incorporated most of these international frameworks in our laws, in our constitutions, and in our policies. But do we implement them? Are they, do we enforce them? Why do we find ourselves in the situation we find ourselves? AU, is it strong enough? Is it pretending? Do we walk our talk? at the AU, because right now I belong, I made a statement at the General Assembly last month on the, the we are developing a compact on migration, orderly migration and what have you. Now, what is the Africa's position? If we come in as individuals or as blocks, are we going to be able to discuss with Africa, I mean with Europe? It looks like the EU, Europe is already organized, except for a few that they are checking. 
But in Africa, do we check other uh, partner states? Those are some of the questions I'm putting down for you. And then now we talk about migration and forced migration. For me, any ordinary type of migration other than forced migration should be to some extent voluntary. You should decide. And now we are hearing what should be voluntary migration has now become economic migration. And I question that. Because, yes, it is for greener pastures, but don't I have a right to actually choose to go and live in Spain, in, in, in Netherlands, for five years and then come out? Is, doesn't the international law give me that? Should I really w w go only for economic whatever? Suppose I want to go to see what they do in there. So for me, any type of, I mean, the, the, the ordinary type of migration, other than the forced migration, must be voluntary. Secondly, it must be safe. It should be orderly. It should be regular orderly, regular scene. It should be profiting. It should meet the intention of the migrant, the person who is leaving his own country. And then there should be respect. And when I get there, I should start being respected from the country of living to the country of uh, whether it is um, what is this thing when it transit, and then to the country of destination. And then I should also be respected the day I want to return. And I should be respected when I get to work. I, 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 I am protected by the laws of that country, as well as international laws. And the day I want to return, I should get the same treatment. Then on forced migration, I think my colleagues have digested this. This is an issue where there is desperation. But what I would want to ask here is that human rights of all migrants must be protected. We sign these treaties. All countries, Europe, Africa, most of us have signed these treaties. So we must adhere to the conditions of what? Then the social inclusion. There has to be social inclusion while I'm in this country, refugee or no refugee. Yesterday, some people talked about the law, laws are applied separately. And then there has to be some kind of cohesion. And then there should be no, I mean, we should have no form of discrimination. I beg your pardon no discrimination, which includes racism. And this is where we get a problem. You're black, you're in trouble. Wherever you go. Xenophobia and intolerance. We have to tolerate each other. If we are now able to tolerate each other in this room, then why should it change when we get to the borders? I have traveled widely, I'm not a young girl, but I want to tell you my experience before independence and now after independence is a problem. You just have to go to a European country and at the immigration and you see the way we are treated. And I want us also to discuss the return journey. Do we treat the Europeans the way we are treated in our countries? In Uganda here, the whole of East Africa, we are too happy to see any color. We are so embracing. But why is it that we must have our own line and then you are a suspect? I have a diplomatic passport. I'm a very senior person in this government. Before I joined politics, 
I was at the rank of a minister at the Uganda Human Rights Commission, but I still had problems at immigration. I can argue my own case, but what about you people? I can throw a diplomatic passport at their face. I can refuse to move where I'm being shoved to move, but what about you people? And then you, the youth. Finally, sorry, I'm excited. <laughs> Finally, I want to say Africa must pull ourselves together, particularly East Africa. We must form ourselves into a solid block. We must have a, a one law for migration. I was so happy when my sisters, you see, they are pointing out to us our weaknesses when they are talking about there should be no conditionality to migration, particularly on aid. But this is being practiced. <coughs> do our leaders really go and negotiate for us, or do they negotiate for themselves, or do they negotiate for the government only? And what is the description of a government? I thank you. I have been working with the University of Ghana at the Regional Institute for Population Studies and also Center for Migration Studies. I would like to say um, that we actually don't have research evidence supporting most of the things we are doing. Whilst Europe and, of course, Africa are working hard at irregular migration. We all know that a lot of irregular migrants move because there are networks helping them. To the extent that even children are moving. I was just looking at the statistics yesterday. 28% of migrants to Europe uh, youth, 15 to 24 years. How are they moving? Where do they get capital from? Now, academia or research, the little research we have, indicates that it's even no more one person raising money to travel, but families. And family is a strong word in Africa. If I have to travel and bring money home, and support other family members. They are more than willing to support my travel or to find somebody to help to go. So there's an ever-growing network. Once one, one person goes, so we have the word chain migration. You go, you send letters, you are in contact. So as the first speaker said, development is rather encouraging more migration. So if you go and develop my village, you put roads, and you put certain facilities there, especially the networks. The children can reach anywhere. And that anywhere they see on the TV. And therefore, irregular migration is not a risk in their eyes. We are calling it a risk. And it did. If Europe is dealing with pe persons who are coming with documents, I don't think there will be any discussion here. What they are dealing with is those who do not have papers. And these we must actually look at. And unfortunately, in the research industry, irregular migration is not a popular area. It's difficult to study them. Try the media. The media just give you journalistic evidence, which you may not be able to take very far because they themselves are limited by ethical principles, not to report everything that they may see. So that's my first observation, that we need research evidence to support all the policies that we are actually adopting. We have done it the other way around. We adopt policy and then we go and do research. So the policy is not based on evidence in a number of cases, especially when you think about irregular migration. And then there's a gray area 
why we should rather be united, Europe and, uh, and uh, Africa, that's why we are rather having problems. I'm talking about the demographics. In Africa, the population increase is still very fast. In Ghana, over 100 young people graduate from the university, 100,000, sorry, from the university every year. And the number is increasing. According to last year's uh, reports, over 200,000 young people have graduated. Why are we going to find work for them? And in Europe, the population in a number of countries is declining. And people are needed in the hospitality sector. The care industry is the fastest growing in Europe. And the number of people moving to provide care from people moving from Africa to provide care, not only in Europe, but other parts of the world, is the fastest growing uh, uh, volume of migration, apart from international students. So if somebody needs people to work, and somebody is also having too many people, I'm just speaking very simple language. Why don't the two of them meet in the market? Demand and supply. Yes. Why are we not meeting on those terms? Because one, we are afraid in Africa to say that we are having too many people. We still are afraid. That's why our family planning programs are no more a priority. If you check the funding of family planning programs, it's still going down and down. And Europe is also, excuse me to say, quite not very enthusiastic about using the demographic argument that we need to replace the population that we are actually in need of people to work at least in the hospitality sector. So when there are divisions within Europe, and for some time now, Germany, UK, France, and Netherlands eased part of their policy to attract skilled labor, what do we see in that? It means that, well, of course, I can attract skilled labor. What about unskilled labor? Then we have to go to the level of the household. Who are taking on it, these irregular migrants and giving them work so that they are even bringing more of their type? It's the individual households. So some time ago, um, UK tried to say, well, if you give rent to somebody, accommodation to somebody, we want you to make sure that that person has papers. It didn't last. Because the mothers who are going to work now and therefore need somebody to take care of their children. And the families which need somebody to do household chores or to take care of an aged person cannot afford the kind of wage which is in the market. The wage they can afford is the one which is arranged with an irregular migrant who is willing to take just anything, just anything which is far higher than what the person would take in Africa. So there's rationality behind all that the people are doing. We need to understand these processes. Because go to America, the fences are being built, but we have not involved the people who have been inviting all these irregular migrants to work in their homes. So we need to look at that gray area also. And I believe that is the area we can have a united front to tackle this problem. Why are people still having too many people? And why are some also in need of people to work? And then finally, I think we are neglecting some very strong institutions. The churches do a lot, in fact, with refugees. Even though in Ghana, for example, um, the government doesn't seem to be saying that let's embrace refugees, integrate them in society. The churches do. And I know there are other stronger institutions 
than government who can handle refugees and even in a better way. So why are we moving along without these faith-based organizations? And finally, I think you have a very good combination of backgrounds here. I must appreciate it again. We should never meet as academics <coughs> and policy makers. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. We need to come together, have all that we need from each other, and then move on. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Badasso. Um, last but not least, we'll have uh, Mr. Esene uh, from Nigeria to share his perspective. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Matthias. I work for the ICMPD. I mean, I'm different from Naomi. I come from two different institutions. Uh, but um, I will not be speaking uh, with the perspective of ICMPD as an institution. I'll just talk as an African youth. Uh, to start with, uh, yesterday I, I saw, we all saw the music, the dance, the energy the youthfulness of that uh, the Ugandans you know, showed us during the cultural display. And for once, I was proud to be an African youth. I have never in my life described myself along any demographic lines. It has never crossed my mind. But yesterday, and of course, again, this conference has provided that opportunity for us to talk about Africa migration. And now, the, and I'm also very surprised that uh, my colleague here brought issue of demographic into the debate because that was what I was going to focus on anyway. Now, what has made migration discourse very toxic is a kind of a narrative that we construct to describe it. Like you have said rightly, we make quite some number of postulations, but we do not have evidence to back it. Yes, true, we know that. Because migration is human, so sometimes one becomes very emotional. Now, if you look at the debate that has come up over the past 10 years, you see a lot of um, discussions that are driven by some very strong nationalistic uh, tendencies. We see that, of course, in Europe, because now we are discussing perspective. Perspective has to do with how do we see it? What's the European perspective? What's the African perspective? Now, now let's start from what it actually says. Now, from demographic, even the concept note of this event that we're having says that the African population is growing. <laughs> what that presupposes <laughs> is that as the population is growing, you have a growing youth population and you know that uh, Africa has experienced a lot of conflicts, and that will trigger migration, outbursts into Europe, and it creates some fear. But we have data to support that. Yes, it's true. It's a fact. Look at the demographic. The population is growing. But what has happened? I'll give you some examples. A very few ones. In Nigeria, in 2016, we have about 25,000 irregular migrants that have transversed. They uh, tried to go through the Sahara Desert to Europe. 25,000. That's a huge number. You see that in press. In 2016, you have 2.2 million people internally displaced. I mean, 2.2 million people displaced as a result of the Boko Haram's urgency. Now, 95,000 of the 2.2 million displaced persons crossed international borders and they ended up in Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, not Europe. That's less than 10% of the displaced population. It means over 90% of the displaced population went to other parts of the country. So that simply means Africans will not invade Europe. Because its population is growing, because there is poverty, because there are lack of opportunity, because there are no jobs. 
Now, let's go a little bit step further. Like I said, what has driven this narrative is because, by the way, I'm West African, for instance. West Africa is of concern to Europe because the, the greatest number of irregular migrants from the African side come from West Africa. And Nigeria, for instance, has the highest figure. Nigeria is actually number five in the global you know, data um, matrix. Interestingly, I come from that part of Nigeria, the south part. I come from Benin City of those states. For those who are studying migration very well, I come from Benin City of those states. And that's the one single community in Nigeria that has the highest volume of migration stream gravitating towards you know, using the Sahara Desert as a route. You know. And good enough again, I feel I'm a young man. I fit into the profile of an irregular migrant. <laughs> so so you can imagine the kind of discrimination that I face. But I have never faced any discrimination in you. I haven't faced any discrimination in you. Rather, I am discriminated against in Nigeria, in Africa. That's what I see. I travel to Europe, I get to the borders, and they look at my passport. Mm, what are you here for? They treat me nicely, and they stop entry. But before leaving my borders in Nigeria, somebody calls me, profiles me. I mean, that's what happened. So, but, but that aside, but the point is, the narrative that we have created, there is this assumption, this is an impression that African youth should not dare to dream to migrate. Because they carry the very stigma that describe the social economic environment that they come from. That is what I see. As a black African, when you migrate, it is easier for you to be described as a criminal. Not necessarily because you have committed. I mean, these are emoti, emo, uh, expression of them from, from, from coming from my emotions. But what we are actually saying is because we recognize the fact that the origin state, where they are coming from, has certain kind of, or rather, they carry the stigma of the economic condition of that particular environment. Thirdly, you realize that in African, for instance, there are more European labor mobility of working as experts in Africa than Africans working as experts in Africa. Why? It is not, it's not a question of who is right or wrong. It's just a question of how we understand migration. And I, I, I find it very funny that we, can, we, we should imagine that Africans should remain in Africa. It's fine. Europeans should remain in Europe. Maybe. <laughs> Asians should remain in Asia. Perhaps. Then, we should really be talking about globalization. The question is not a question of migration. Migration is human. We all know that. It's complex. It's complicated. People migrate for various reasons. The focus is managing migration. Of course, of course again, we know the re-intention behind the Valletta sub and the action plan. It's to just have to even stop youth migration because you see the population is growing. They are going to. It's like you have maybe I should just give us an allegory before I conclude. You see, Africa. Africa is like a pot of water boiling, and you feel we think that if we get to some point, it will explode and get to other parts. So 
the Africa, its, popul its growing population has become a threat. And we have some kind of voodoo demographic principle to forecast what will happen in the future. And that's why I've presented that, that data. But in any case, it is very, I can understand why we all have this fear, why we all have this prejudice. It's, 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 I mean, I don't want to, I want to, I don't, I don't want to say it's human to feel that, but it's something, it's, that's the reality. We all have this fear of invasion. We all have this fear of domination. It's there. The only thing that can help us go out of there, especially as experts, as researchers, is to be able to go look at the data and construct a positive narrative that can help us plan better. For instance, as an African, I do have colleagues working with me in ICMPD who are Europeans, who have even traveled across Africa more than I have traveled Africa. You know, so why don't we even start from home? Why don't we encourage intra-regional mobility? Why don't we do that? Why is it difficult? I mean, before I came to Uganda, I had to obtain a visa. But it was a little bit difficult to go through the airport to come to Uganda. And yet I'm an African. But I have colleagues who are non-Africans who have easy access to the visa and who have easy access to other parts of Africa. We are talking about going to Europe. We haven't even done that. But most importantly, and I conclude with this, I don't. I think, and for maybe for um, for the Europeans too, when you are thinking about program, because we are talking about youth from migration, I get the impression that we are looking at the future. You know, so the approach must be long term. Maybe we should redirect all the donor funds that we provide all the aid. We should focus it on education. I think that's what makes it. Because education is what we use. If you have a problem with the, with the kind of curriculum you have, for instance, somebody tells you Napoleon was a great man, it's because you have a certain kind of education that even made you to come to the realization that there are other great men, that there is Professor John in Bitti in Makarere, for instance. You know, it's education. It is education we use to cure even the madness that we have. The, because if our people, if we, we do, if we have, if we look at the top 500 universities in the world, for instance, how many are from Africa? Maybe a few from South Africa and maybe one from Uganda and all that. In the Uganda University, for instance, I believe Nigerians has the greatest number of population in terms of foreign migrants because people are looking for education. You know, so if we direct, and I want to see an Africa where you have experts, medical doctors, you have professionals, you have scientists, people designing rockets, going to the moon, and after all said and done, you have these same people dancing, singing the African song, dancing to that African rhythm, eating that beautiful cuisine, the ones we had yesterday. You see, these same people doing all these things. That's what you see the Chinese do. They have their culture, they have their worldview, everything is there. But they have people who are well educated. It is not in Nigeria, for instance. Nigeria is about the country with the highest number of professors in politics. Yeah, of course. And yet, that's, it's not, I'm not talking about having certificate. We're talking about education that brings enlightenment. It's because Uganda is an enlightened society. That's why you are able to accommodate the number of refugees that you have. Uganda just a population of about 40 million, if I'm not mistaken, hosting 1.3, that means every, out of every four persons you see in Uganda, one is a refugee. That's what it means. That's, that's, that's huge. That's very huge. But I believe because it is an enlightened society, that's why you are able to accommodate it. So maybe we should look for we should see how we can really focus because the budgets that the educational system in Africa gets 
is insignificant compared to the amount to seed funds that universities in other parts of the world get. I rest my case. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, very enlightening and inspiring uh, contributions from every side. I don't want to go into debate too much now, but of course with you, myself, just make uh, one or two remarks. Um, when we speak of migration, with translation, voluntary migration, I think probably it's a better expression than economic migration because economic migration says, you know, you are, in a way, you are greedy more and more, but voluntary migration maybe is a better expression in the contrast to the enforced migration. But um, in Europe, of course, and this I wanted to underline, in the European Union, we have this free movement, the possibility also to take a job in another country, but already this is also contested in Europe. So there is, of course, uh, is, there is uh, xenophobia, there is racism playing a role. But inside Europe already we have the debate. Uh, is it really good that so many Romanians or Bulgarians from the poorer country are working in the richer countries? So it's not only Europe against Africa. So it's, uh, and therefore the important element, and I'm very grateful to the colleague, uh, all the colleagues, but colleague from, from Ghana, who spoke about the question of uh, labor migration, because this is the big issue, together, of course, with what Kati mentioned, the question of the welfare state. Uh, and yes, we should deal with this issue of the sector of caring and hospitals, but already, at least in my country, Austria, but also in some other countries, I think also in the Netherlands, we have already many poor Europeans who do that kind of job. So for the moment, there is some com some competition even in that sector, but nevertheless in the long run, uh, where our richer societies, all the societies, but the richest perhaps before, getting more and more necessity of caring people. And when we think about in uh, some of our countries, that robots should take the job, in Japan already is done, then it is crazy that we will rather employ robots, um, you know, give them some human face, and not have people from, uh, you know, ordinary human beings doing the job. So I think this is, a, this is an issue where we really have to discuss how we can cooperate also in the question of skilled and unskilled labor. Because also for the future we will have unskilled labor or less skilled labor. But caring, of course, already is some sort of a skilled labor because you need some skills. And what we did is to regulate that market so that we don't, at least in many of our countries, don't have that situation that these people who are in the caring sector are people who are in the black market. It is already regulated. So this is one element I just wanted to mention. But uh, because it is not a question of free movement, it's a question of labor migration, mm -hmm. where also inside Europe you have already some of the disputes. But I think we should uh, open the floor. And maybe, yes, please. Okay, thanks for to all the presenters. I uh, just want to make uh, two or three comments and uh, then one practical recommendation uh, coming from a person, a white European who has spent about 10 years in Africa. So I think this particular topic uh, fits very well. Uh, so the first comment is that I believe that the refugee system in Europe, as we all know it, uh, it's going soon to disappear. And this is mainly because of three reasons. The first one is that uh, the context on which the Geneva Convention was based uh, has changed in these 16 years. The second that was already mentioned is that um, we've seen that it's, it's impossible to distinguish between uh, a refugee uh, and, and as a, a, an economic migrant. What I mean is that uh, that differentiation has to be done before the person arrives. Uh, 
uh, in the country. Once the person is already in Europe, there's not much that you can do because, uh, as you said, it's very difficult to uh, uh, send people back. So I think we're going uh, towards the scenario where uh, most of the application will be uh, in Africa, and then some European countries will probably and pick uh, among the most vulnerable refugees and bring them to Europe. Uh, and now I'm getting to the recommendation. So because more and more uh, African refugees will stay and will remain in Africa, I think it's important that we make sure that refugees in African countries have access to social economic rights. And we can tap on the uh, Ugandan uh, experience uh, in the sense that the, the policy in Uganda is, is granting this access and also because of the strong leadership in, in promoting uh, refugee rights. Uh, we, we, my institution recently did the research on access to socioeconomic rights for refugees in six African countries. And what we realize is that uh, in countries such as Ethiopia, Kenya, the law is actually good. Uh, so access to health care, uh, education, uh, employment rights yeah. are granted to all persons living. The problem, of course, is the implementation. Uh, so my recommendation would be in, in every forum, we need to make sure that countries in Africa that are hosting refugees grant full access to socioeconomic rights. The second comment is about um, European migration policy, which are highly contradictory, as most of the migration policy. Uh, why they're contradictory? Because, uh, in a way, they say uh, we do not need uh, uh, unskilled uh, or low-skilled migrants. Uh, that's what they say on paper, but then we know that there, are all, there is always a backdoor for unskilled and low-skilled uh, migrants to, to get in. Uh, this is simply because the economic system that we have, uh, it's also based on the exploitation of vulnerable uh, workers. So uh, it's, it's important that the unskilled uh, labor or the, in general the, the, the labor system is, is regulated and I'm thinking about my country, Italy, where uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, undocumented migrants from Ghana and Nigeria uh, in the south picking up uh, fruits and, and, and vegetables, and, and that market is not regulated at all. So until we have that system in place, that will cause uh, a huge problem. Uh, and, and also someone was asking, when, when is the limit? So. When do we reach a point where we should say stop to migration? Well, economists will, will tell you that uh, uh, the point is where until migrants make uh, a net positive contribution to the economy, uh, they are welcome. Then when they're not making that positive contribution, then they should stop. And that's why um, all policy are more in favor for skilled migrants because they will contribute more in taxes compared to unskilled uh, or low-skilled migrants. And the last uh, comment, tapping on what uh, Delali said, uh, I think there's too much emphasis on the issue of root causes. Uh, I'm not saying that that's not important. Those external factors are uh, certainly fundamental, but uh, we need to look also at more internal factors determining migration and I'm, I'm certainly thinking of the role of networks uh, perpetuating uh, migration uh, not only from a perspective of the sending uh, countries but also on the receiving country so there should be more research looking at when uh, those networks in, in the receiving countries are attracting people and when do they stop attracting people, because that can also help us to determine where certain flows will, will go, and when that flow will diminish, and where that flow will stop. It's not just about the root causes. Thank you. Honorable uh, Veronica.
we pointed out very serious point here that uh, when even we were trying to move to Europe, you are restricted. We ex explained that we thought it was just for the young people. Or for me, I even thought like it wasn't for refugees. Last year, during the June uh, Global Refugees Consultation and uh, the UNSL Consultation in Geneva, we were given a uh, travel document here by the Ugandan government to go and represent the Ugandan refugee youth. So when we applied for a visa at the Swiss uh, embassy, Geneva was where we had the refugees convention. So we were going to Geneva, where there was a refugee convention. And then we were denied access to Geneva, where the document was even produced. So we were asking ourselves, why would we, why would we be having like a uh, travel document when we even don't use it? So uh, after serious hassle, with the High Commission for Refugees getting involved, so we are uh, finally granted access to Geneva. When we reached there, some of us were even struggling, we were fighting to get back to Africa. We were waiting for the days to get done, so that we get back to Africa, because we are missing the, uh, the Kalo, the cassava here. But the European were what they were monitoring us. People were moving after us, they thought we were going to work to escape. In our brains, we were uh, missing home. But people think that we want, we want to maybe escape and maybe remain in Europe. So these are the things that are really uh, very fun from the perspective of the other side of the continent. So uh, one thing is that we should make our borders to be at least open, such that when these borders are open, these refugees or, let me say the youth, the African youth, they will go and discover on their own that there is nothing good there or there is nothing good in, uh, in America that will take you and maybe remain that side. Everything is here. You just need to create the environment here where you are. If you create the right environment, you will create the, the, uh, the required resources. Because no one will come from outside. We don't owe anyone anything. No one will come from outside to come and change everything here. We have to change it and create the environment that we want. That is the only thing that an African youth, will, uh, that an African youth can do. So that we can keep ourselves here. You see, like when you come to Uganda, they will ask for a, what, a yellow paper card. When, when a South Sudan is going to Kenya, they don't ask for a yellow paper card. When a South Sudan is going to Tanzania, we don't ask for a visa. In Rwanda, as South Sudan, they don't ask for a visa. But in Uganda, we are just close here. It's just like a walk for a distance. From Nimbula to Irego is like five minutes walk. But you, you want a South Sudan, it's like last year. A South Sudan has to pay like $100 for you to cross to Uganda. We were, we were neighbors. It is good that uh, a lawmaker is here. So take some of this recommendation to the parliament. Say we should open the borders to all other Africans. Say that when we move across Africa, we can learn from each other. I can learn from my fellow Nigerian. I can learn from my fellow uh, Ghanaian if at least they can come to South Sudan. But because of the boundaries, because of the, the $50 we collect, we will not be rich by the $50 that we collect at the border. It is what we create, the network that we create that will make us rich. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I to pick up from where my brother Marut stopped. I think it's a call to us as young people to have a common agenda. If someone asks us today, what vision do we have for the continent as young people, not as politicians visioning for us, but as young people, what vision do we have? If we do have a vision, a shared vision, probably we will work together from all corners of the continent. Because right now, perhaps you could say, do we have a common agenda that by 2020, we must have reduced the numbers of refugee population in Africa by 20% or by 80%, something like that, would help us guide our common campaign in a way that we have a hand goal to achieve. But if we are all crying and blaming and you know, complaining, we're not changing anything. We need to have a common agenda, a common vision that we will do it as young people. And we demand politicians to respect that. May you realize that in Africa, Politicians would rather see a young African die in the desert of Niger or uh, across the sea as they exit the continent because those are addicts who are seeking for change, better lives, or improvement in political system at home. So they would rather go away than stay home. Most politicians, from even within the East African, they would rather see their citizens cross and live in another country than stay and make noise for change or for good governance or human rights respects our countries. So it's upon us to get a way of combining and making a formal, you know, strategic point as young people to do something. And then lastly, let us understand the tribal nature of conflict in Africa. That is also determining the tribal migration 
we are seeing. South Sudan is here. There are cities in East Africa that do not probably, is not friendly for some particular tribes in South Sudan. To be honest, the Incas are, you know, they, they are happy in Uganda and, and where are happy in Nairobi. Why? Because of the neighboring political system, the geopolitical, we know what is going on. We are the one playing all these games. So, the tribal nature of conflict requires a political reconciliation. As young people, what can we do? When can we come together and work towards a political reconciliation in a way that will uproot these prolonged historical injustices that are still far too many? And then, finally, be aware that we have political system where the political egos are ruining our countries. They are, they are setting the continent ablaze. And we are, we are talking every day, but this is the time that we have to move beyond rhetoric. We have European who are our partners. We can blame them, we can complain, but answer is at home. European or not, no. Let us also understand refugee or war is business. You may ask yourself, who really wants war to end? Somebody talked about how many experts are where, you know, how many Africans are experts in the global humanitarian leadership. Probably none. Most Africans are drivers, project coordinators in the field, but experts who are running bigger offices are out of the continent. So, young people, we are killing our own. We are destroying our own. And we are creating job markets for other people. Think about it. Thank you very much. My name is Jessica. I work with the International Organization for Migration here in Kampala. I, I just had uh, a few comments uh, on um, some of the presentations from the panelists. Uh, and I want to agree uh, with uh, most of the panelists. First of all, I think um, uh, all actors either in Europe, here, uh, we need to um, come to appreciate that migration is here to stay and the reactionary approach of closing borders um, uh, and all that is not going to stop migration. People will move. And um, as we all know, migration actually, if well managed, is very desirable. Is, is, it is very beneficial. But or we, or we, we have to invest in it. We have to uh, make it humane, orderly, and, uh, and uh, beneficial for all uh, that take part in it. I just had a comment regarding uh, the uh, on development assistance uh, to address uh, factors that compel people to move. I think it is very, very important because um, we 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 cannot just sit by and not look into these issues that are compelling people to move. I mean, the, the issues of uh, conflict that you know, bring about refugees. But then there are also people who are not refugees, but there are factors that are really compelling people to move. I don't think youth, as, as we know, they're the majority of people who are on the move. I don't think anyone would just wake up to just move because you just want to move. There are issues that push people to move. And I think these are the issues that we need to look at addressing. And I think this is where development aid needs to go into. The youth population in, in Africa is, is, is huge. And it's there. It's the reality now. And I think for Europe, I would, I would imagine we should be looking at, OK, how do we harness this? How, how do we make use of, of, of this very large youth population? I, I also wanted to add on to one of the comments regarding integration and then opening borders within Africa. As we all know, first of all, mobility within Africa is very high. 
beyond mobility out of Africa. And I think it is important within the continent that we facilitate this free movement. I see this will, first of all, reduce the use of handlers, smugglers within the continent itself. Here yeah, you're breaking the networks. And then, we, you know, uh, the issue of net networks um, at, the, at, the, at the peripheries or at the borders of the continent could be looked at. But also within the continent itself, there is a very huge, uh, uh, huge uh, network. Uh, that is facilitating irregular migration. So I think, first of all, facilitating migration within Africa. And I know also that there are fears which are not backed, that if you open borders, then people will easily now move to Europe. I think, like, uh, like um, Mrs. Badasu said, I think there is really need for using evidence in developing policy. And, and I believe that if we facilitate mobility within Africa itself, I think we'll be creating opportunities for youth within Africa. And then by the time they think of going to Europe, that would be like not a compelled decision, but out of, um, I, I don't know the word, but that's it. <laughs> um, yes, so basically this is what I, 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 I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, asked, uh, I want first of all to thank our day and speakers. It's very nice to hear about different voices there. But we go in the same sense to say that migration is an opportunity. Migration is a right for everyone. It's a very good thing to hear. I want first of all fall to offer this something we have to share as African to European. We need we African to renew this value of solidarity in Europe. We are seriously losing your value of solidarity. We are criminalizing these boats who are saving people in the sea, Mediterranean Sea as criminal. We are criminalizing these people in Europe. I love these people in Europe who save people who are undocumented. Take them at home. Take care of them. These people who welcome Syrian refugees who show their solidarity. They are criminalized now in Europe. We Africa, we like this value of solidarity. You know, this to be renewed in Europe. The, the, the second, second thing is, many of, of us told about, yes, we told about this uh, issue of labor, free movement, labor migration. I have to tell that leaving skies on unskilled people is not, is not a debate at all. Even skies people, as example, going to Europe, America, is, is not a loss to Africa at all. It's not a loss, it's a brain gain. Because they come back as diaspora to provide their knowledge. So when you see in every holidays, the number of African diasporas who come back in vacation, or who come to realize enterprises, who come to invest in Africa, to share their knowledge with Africans, is amazing. It's amazing. You see in China, in India, diaspora is a resource for us. They go, they pick knowledge, and they come back to Develop their countries. They, they come back to change the governments in their countries also. It's not only a question of knowledge, it's governments also. Because when they go back somewhere, they see what the citizenship is working. They want the citizenship work at same in their countries and they come back to improve this change in their countries. For us, we have to think of that also. And on for labor migration, there is thoughts on that. There is this UN Convention on Labor Migration set in the 1990s. Why, why European Union refuse to sign to ratify this convention? <coughs> why? Yes, as the city is, is our role as youths to put on the right questions. It's the first role, the first recognition. What is the right question after phases during the debate? We thought about African must to speak in the one voice. I have this chance to be used, used to attend conferences, European Union and African Union conferences, in rubber process and valuta process. I focus, I work so much on valuta process. I attend the meetings, I attend I, I was last time in Valeta for the senior official meeting with ministerials. And as representative of African Civil Society. 
what I show, what we can see during this meeting, it is a closed meeting. The Minister of Africa, Minister of Europe. You can see that, yes, European we speak in the one voice, but African, oh, great. African because of interests, financial interests. You will see African Union has this position, and you have Senegal or Nigeria against African Union position because they receive one from UK and it's very incomprehensible. And this stuff, you know, there is this European they say, they say, they lunch. They can decide themselves to push back people without consultation with African countries. African Union reject this European Union they say, they say. I was there during the meeting. Malian government who faced this problem of European Union they say, they say, seen Malian deported with European Union they say, don't raise the problem because they have one hundred million euro, euro providing the European Union to cause his no. It's why we civil society, we youths, we have to raise our voice during these meetings. I raise my voice, say, this is the problem we are facing now. We don't respect us. You know this European Union investment plan, we don't constitution Africa. As we don't have money on that, that's the last thing I have to raise, please. African youths want change. They fight for change. They have two options. To be killed by the government because they want change in the countries or to be killed in the sea. You see in West African countries, we have, or Central African countries, we have a, a money we call CFA. France CFA. It's a money provided by France to our country. We in our region, we are fighting to move on this money. And what France is doing is better keep this money to you. Who on that developed you? <laughs> and we can tell these global issues, please. We, need, we have knowledge to face all that. We need solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Yusuf. Uh, okay, I'm not going to the same direction like my brother, but he was saying the truth. We don't need this safer. I agree with you. So, um, some two small points I wanted to um, discuss a bit about it before the, 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 the working session. The first one is uh, about this hotspot in Niger for refugees. Uh, you know, I've been working with the refugees for a long time. You know, you will never plan to go to Europe or wherever once you're a refugee. What it, anything you need is to go out from where you are. How can you plan to apply before leaving your country for asylum? This is impossible. Of course, many people will apply, but we will call it economic migrant because they have the time to think about it, because they don't have other possibility. And the second point regarding this center is the center will be in Agadez in Niger. How would be the case of the people from Niger? Because you cannot, in your own country, you want to go out of your country, you cannot go to a center. We can guarantee you that we will be safe there. Hmm? This discussion we need to have, we need to, to have many discussion with Macron. I know that uh, with many conditionalities, he's going to do it, but he's not going to bring anything to the issues because nobody is going there. The second point I wanted to address, uh, I will raise the question directly to Honorable His Excellency Zamin. It's about uh, the youth volunteering problem that uh, the African Union has, which is a great concept in Africa. And this year, last month, about 42,000 young people applied for 200 places. I don't understand why. Why African Union, the sample program we have, the, the youth volunteering program of African Union is the unique mobility program in Africa. But we have only 200 places for 42,000 applications. I don't understand why it should be centralized at uh, Addis Ababa. West Africa, ECOVAS, COMESA, why not trying to reproduce the same possibility to all our young people? What is going on with the program? I used to be very close to the youth division. Most of the people getting jobs through this are sons and daughters of ambassadors and high level people, which is not very fresh. What about the other young people we are going? Which kind of possibilities and perspective we can give to those young people? Those are the questions I want to directly to His Excellency uh, and if you can tell us maybe the future of this program because it's a great program and I do like it but unfortunately it's not for us it's just for the son of the and the daughter of the diplomat and ambassador. <laughs>
Okay, um, I will ask the panelists, just take one minute to respond to the issues that have been raised by the participants. Thank you. part of this conference is really to, to hear the other perspective of what I'm hearing in my daily life. So, so thank you for that, because it's really very, very valuable. A just a couple of more remarks also what was said about that Europe is almost losing almost e even its support to host refugees, right? And, and I, really, I really fear that too. And in that extent, from what Yusuf said at the end, I think it would be interesting to discuss Looking from that perspective, hearing any European politician actually calling for legal routes, be it from centers in Nigeria or any, anywhere else, I think is a good thing. Um, um, but um, I sense that it's, it's considered here, at least as the plan as it was launched by Macron, as a negative development. So I would like to, you know, also perhaps in the working groups or in, in, the, in, the, in the corridors to discuss a bit more with you there, because I don't hear almost any European leader calling for legal routes. So for me, anyone who does it, actually, uh, I tend to look at it more or more positively. Of course, it's a question on how to organize it. It was interesting also what you said on diaspora, because I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people in Europe don't understand, that the diaspora, and not only, you know, in, in economic terms, but in terms of knowledge sharing, is so much more important than any of the development aid uh, came, coming actually from Europe, and as long as we don't recognize this, <laughs> you are you are you are again um, uh, thinking that you have some type of of of, of tool, which is money, um, uh, while taking away, I think, the biggest uh, uh, biggest benefits for for Africa from migrants living in Europe is, of course, this sharing also of the knowledge uh, that is happening. Um, and as a la as a last remark. Honorable to, to my, my dear colleague, um, um, you know, we very often have these debates in, in, in the European Parliament where, um, unfortunately, I don't believe the, works, the world works like we have the right to go wherever we want in the world, and borders are a fact. Um, if I would like to live the next five years in the US, it will not be that easy. Uh, so this is also, you know, the political reality is one of borders, is one of, of um, um, having restrictions on, on movement. And I think it's within those boundaries that we have to look uh, still for the best possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think during the debate, there is a question of mobility in Africa of top. And uh, there are quite few um, people would like to know what we are uh, African is doing. Uh, on this point. I'd just like to inform everybody that since 2016 in the Kigali summit, already there is a very significant and very serious step has been taken on the top level, including even distributing in the passport, African Union passport to the leadership, uh, whether on the head state and the minister, the ambassador, as a first step. But also uh, already there is a proper process in aim to have one African passport. That's already a decision has been taken and it is focused on implementing such kind of a decision. Number two, right now in Mauritius, in, uh, yes, in uh, Mauritius now, there is a, 
a meeting uh, uh, focused on a protocol uh, for free movement on the level of African African countries. And I think we, we have uh, made uh, a very important step towards you know free mobility uh, on the level of African continent. Just that is just for information, and I believe we will uh, we will uh, continue that because we, there is a, a continental free trade agreement which we are working on it also, uh, by which we, we we can offer quite a lot of these uh, answer to quite a lot of concern which has you have been raising. Um, I would like to uh, also to raise one point or another. Uh, um, I would like that also Europe will uh, take in consideration um, uh, in inclusiveness, not selective approach. And that's been reflected in Valletta and reflected in many other uh, places. Because uh, we still ask question whether this is for Africa or just for uh, some countries on bilateral relations. Uh, I, I think we still need to, to talk on that in more depth because we need to clarify this, this aspect. Uh, the other point, uh, the question of one voice. Uh, I, I agree that you know we need to speak one voice wherever we go, or as a continent, not as bloc or as regional bloc. And that's really uh, we ask Europe also to help us to 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 implement that kind of uh, that obje objective. To respond to my colleague from from Mali, Yusuf, uh, on question of you know volunteer, that is uh, it's not uh, my uh, my area. My area, I'm a rapporteur of the subcommittee of refugees and, and the IDPs and returnees. I think you could, the question uh, could be uh, correctly addressed to the uh, Human Resources Department, and I think you will find, uh, will find uh, uh, adequate answer. Uh, without going in, uh, you know, what you have said, you know, who is, uh, who is benefiting or not, that is a question you can check directly with the department. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all those compliments and my colleague uh, panelists. Um, I have three comments. One is to really appreciate the, the gentleman on the floor who came up with uh, improving on the nature of conflict in Africa, particularly the tri tribal conflicts. I think we should graduate from tribes to something else. Mm. Let's leave that. <coughs> the other one is uh, I, I totally support and I'm so appreciative of the, um, my colleague from Ghana <coughs> who brought the issue of research. It's true some, st some type of research is being done, but evidence-based uh, democracy demographic kind of research is necessary. And it shouldn't stop at just research for the sake of it. I think we should move to sharing the results of the research here in Africa as at the AU level and then share it with Europe. This is what we found. This is what works for us. This is the best practice for Africa. What is there in Europe? Because already there's a lot of research in, 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 in Europe. Um, finally, the third point is uh, I have never at any conference uh, told things that are not true. So when I talk here about migration and particularly at borders, I'm talking for the majority of those people who suffer at entry points in Europe. And I have no, I have no apology to make, and I want it of emphasized, if necessary, overemphasize that there is a problem. And when I used my own example, that even with a diplomatic passport, I'm asked questions that I shouldn't be asked. For example, somebody is asking you for invitation letter. Before you get a visa, and they know it, matters of common sense. I'm not here to talk about an isolated case of my brother here, who is welcome at entry points abroad. Thank you, you are a young man. 
you haven't uh, experienced what we experienced, but at break time, talk around, and if you have been okay, good luck. But uh, I know in your future lifetime you are going to meet it. <laughs> Finally, I also want to tell you, it is in Nigeria that as a fellow African, I really found it difficult to enter. I live. That's the point. No, this is the second point. I've made the first point. This is a country where you are asked about a page missing in your passport. This is a country where you are asked, did my, yo, you are coming from Uganda. Didn't my brother in Uganda send you with a, a letter, an envelope for me, etc., etc.? So, uh, I think I'll stop here, but I have really liked what has come from the floor. And like I said, I belong to uh, a lot of uh, forums, including the United Nations, and uh, I'm going to take a lot of this to that forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to point out that the migration issues we are handling are not long-term development solutions. Europe has, over the last four decades, invited migrants to solve its labor uh, problems, but it remains almost the same in almost all the countries. But three countries have had some good results, but other uh, factors in the complex, you know, in the complex relationship have contributed to it. So Africa needs to look at the demographic dividend solution that is being um, hammered. We need to look at how we can actually raise our children, educate them, give them good health, manage our economy so that migration will not be the first it doesn't have to be because West Africa, for example, when you are born, migration is already in your head. As you move through life, you are thinking about America, you are thinking about Europe. That one is traditional, it's there. But the one happening now is because I'm a youth and I've finished school, I have to go to Europe. It doesn't have to be the case. And then Europe also. We have to do certain things. I believe that the money being spent on migration could have developed Europe 10 times over. <coughs> if we do what we can do for Europe, all of us, not Europe alone. Now the global economy is so related that you cannot do anything alone. Europe cannot stand alone to solve this problem. Now if Europe decides to use some of the resources, as you rightly said, uh, now we may have better assistance. We may have better cooperation, trade, for example. If Europe supports all that we are doing and we can trade among ourselves, Africa is going to move to another level. And Europe doesn't have to give and give to Africa. It will give to all its citizens first, and then Africa will come as a second you know, um, brother. And I would also like to say that when we do all these things, let's stop thinking Africa and Europe. It's one, it's one big community. We cannot do it alone, whatever. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's coming back to me again. Uh, first, yes back to demographics because I have a problem with the narrative we create. It's a growing youth food population in Africa. And so what? It's an asset. I say again, yes, I'm West African. I come from a particular session that has a very high migratory orientation. It doesn't mean that everybody there is migrating. Even the percentage of people migrating is very significant. So why do we amplify? Let's go back to the data. 
We're talking about research. What does the research show? That's the point I'm making. We have demonstrated here today that majority of the refugee displaced population we have in Africa reside in Africa. We have seen that. Every one for, out of every four person living in Uganda, one is a displaced person. We have shown that. So what that means is that focus should be in Africa. And we understand, for instance, I mean, you, you have said in European Parliament, so reality, the borders are there. Nobody can change that. You know, we have a different, we are born human, but we have, out of cultural history, we have our individual identity. Nobody can, I mean, that tension is always there. It's the reality, is how we manage that tension. We, I cannot live here. I cannot even leave Nigeria and come to Uganda. To just live in Uganda, we are facing some problems. You know, I would have to go through a lot of reintegration process and all that. That's a fact of life. But my point when I talk about education is that because it's far fetched to just discuss migration in isolation of other social realities, mm -hmm. if we have any problem we want to solve, it should not even be about migration. And it must have a long term approach. And the only way to do that, if you are afraid that Africa, we are going to experience more conflict in the 10th, in 10, 20 years from now, and we are going to have and we are getting, the population is getting larger, is educate our people. Even the skilled laborers that we want to go out and work and give us huge remittance. For instance, Nigeria, you have about 23 billion US dollars every year from official channel as remittance from the diaspora community. That's a huge investment. So you still need skilled labor. And how do you get it? It's true education. It is true good education, building good university, that my friend from Mali will not feel inferior because he has a degree from Mali, that he has to go to Harvard somewhere. That I from Nigeria, because I attended University of Ibadan, I will be treated as a second class citizen when I go to seek employment. That's not the reality anyway. I work for international organization. I think I have been lucky, you know, then lastly, my last point is when coming back to discrimination, I have said it as a statement of fact, that the greatest discrimination I have faced is from within Africa. I have said it. So if we even blame Europe for our views, I think we are hypocrites. That's the point I'm making. We are hypocrites. Because we cannot. South Sudan, when South Sudan gained independence, we had just left the university and we had to celebrate in South Sudan is going to be so we are clamoring now that we need to do away with CIFA. That's fine. What's happening in South Sudan? Have we solved the problem? I would blame it. What I already said, how you open that developed Africa. What has Africa done for Africa? What's the point? Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to make one small note before we take leave. Um, the role of the media. I think we're underlooking or underestimating how much power media, social media, print, and internet has. The whole issue of migration and this, the discussions we're having now, as a result of uh, 2015, the influx from Syria, I think Europe got alarmed, and most of them were like, okay, what's going on? It's not that the Africans have just started migrating. The numbers are very, very negligible. Now, what... In my opinion, I think it's happening it's like, okay, if the Syrians can do this, how can we mitigate and stop people from Africa taking the same channels from um, entering into Europe? So I think we need to also bring on board. The media also needs to inform the European people, the Americans, that, you know, in as much as we're having this influx, these are the numbers from Africa, but there are also Africans coming back home, quite a number, but somehow no one wants to talk about it. So I think in our discussions, these are some of the, the perceptions are actually exacerbated by the media. That, that is my take. And then last, uh, lastly, which countries, if you say Africans are migrating, look at the countries that Africans are actually migrating to. These are our former colonial masters. These are our former colonial masters. So they need to also <laughs> take a role in, in, in history. History is actually to blame for what is happening now. Anyway, um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, as my colleague said, uh, I'll hand over to the moderator. Thank you, thank you so much, Winnie and Hannes, and thank you so much, our panelists. I, for one, have been very well educated about these issues. And I want to thank you, the audience. Right now, we are going to go for break of about 15 minutes. So we